Let's talk to uh, Dr. Michael to see uh, what he can tell us. Dr. Michael, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Oh, uh, good morning there, Mike. It's awfully good to see you, uh, uh, considering the circumstances, yes. obviously. It's not very, a, yeah, a very, very sad, sad, a very sad moment, really. The Titan was estimated to have had a 96-hour supply of oxygen when it began its voyage. Um, that should now presumably have, have run out. There doesn't appear to be any, any sign of anything, really. Uh, we heard yesterday that there were some noises recorded by one of the uh, one of the craft monitoring the sea, but that was kind of dis dismissed as probably not coming from from Titan. Um, you've been down there uh, in the depths of the Atlantic. You've seen the Titanic wreckage that, that they wanted to see. Well, they, they may have seen it as well. Um, tell us a little bit about what it's like to be down so far under the surface of the sea. <clears throat> well, Mike. Um it's uh, very hard to relive the situation because I, I almost lost my own life down there. But, uh, you know, um, I was uh, invited in September of 2000 when I was uh, the science editor at ABC News to become the first television correspondent to report from the Titanic. My uh, first inclination was to decline because I have a deathly fear of water. I always have my whole life. Mm -hmm. But I thought this is my job. I'm going to do it. And it, it sounded interesting to me. I thought this is an opportunity to educate the people about the Titanic and so forth. And uh, so I went. And the dive went very well. Uh, it took two and a half hours to get down. Uh, what, I was on a, should say, a Russian submarine. We left from Halifax, Nova, Nova Scotia. And then we toured the bow. And at the bow, um, we had a moment of prayer uh, for the people whose lives were lost down there. It, it hits you really hard, Mike. Yeah, you I go imagine. down there thinking you're going to see the wreck of a ship, a very famous ship, and that alone is profound. But then when you get down there, it's hard to describe to you the feeling you have. It's almost like you sense the presence of the people who lost their lives, men, women, and children. It's a profound feeling. Yeah. Uh, and everything was fine until we started going towards the stern. You will recall the Titanic broke into two, the bow went straight down, the right. stern did a somersault, landed on its back, exposed the propeller. So when we were heading to the stern, my eye caught sight of that propeller, very shiny, sticks out like a sore thumb, everything else is gray and drab. And then I sensed that my sub was accelerating and I thought that was rather odd. We should be decelerating. And next thing I know, uh, we collide uh, with the, uh, the propeller stuck behind the and i later found out mike that the reason for that was we got caught up in an underwater current that just drove us between the inverted poop deck and the blades of the propeller our, our sub was much smaller than the blades of this gigantic propeller mm. and so i knew immediately from the collision and huge pieces of the titanic started falling down on us wow. and i was watching all of this through a little eight inch porthole and I knew immediately that uh, we were in a uh, life-threatening situation. So mm. we fell silent. We wanted our pilot, Victor, who's a former Russian MiG pilot, uh, to have all the time he needed and all the uh, concentration he needed in order to try to extricate us because we were in a situation that was very difficult to get out of. It really is an incredible thing to have done. It must still be sort of with you at all times in a way that you must probably never have a day when you don't think about it. It's a, it's a, yes, Mike. And, and in the last 72 hours, it's just become like, uh, I can't even begin to tell you, I've had to relive it. Mm. And uh, it, I, I feel such a kinship to the folks down there, whether they're alive or dead. Right. I, I feel like I'm down there with them because I right. know exactly what the, they've gone through. So yeah, it's been difficult. And when you are down there, is it is it deathly quiet? Can you hear anything at all? It's quiet and it's dark. Uh, mm. One of the things that surprised me, even though I'm a scientist and I know about these things, um, you lose sunlight pretty quickly within 400 feet. Mm. The, there's just it's utter blackness, and most of the trip down two and a half hours or so, uh, for us anyway, um, <clears throat> it's utter blackness. Our pilot every now and again turned on the spotlight we could see, but there's virtually no life down there. You see little rat tail fish a little uh, very delicate sea star, all of them titanium white because there's no sunlight, there's mm. no color, so everything is white. Uh, and then uh, and then when you touch down and he turned on the spotlight, it looked like the lunar surface. It was quite remarkable to think, my God, you know, when you swim in a swimming pool and you hit the bottom of the swimming pool, you think, oh, wow, I'm at the bottom of the swimming pool. But then when you're at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, 
Mike, you got to think that that is just an experience that I'll never forget. Yeah. It was like landing on the moon. Yeah. I mean, whenever I've done anything under the sea, which has not been much more than snorkeling, really, or, or maybe diving down, jumping off a boat or something like that, there's always a moment when you're coming up where you think, I just really need to get to the surface. I think I'd be, I'd be terrified to be that deep, knowing that you can't literally swim back up. I think that was it. Not only do I have a deathly fear of water, but, you know, tend to be claustrophobic. And I had to s just suck it up when yeah. I, I when I got into that sub. It's a three man sub teardrop shaped, very small, no mm. frills. It was originally designed as a science scientific uh, vessel. But, yeah, you're down there and you're literally buried alive in water, not mm. buried alive in ground. But you're you're in this tin can and two and a half miles of water above you, you can imagine that there's just no way out when you get stuck as we did. You can't call a tow service <laughs> like your car is stuck in the mud and say, hey, get me out of here. Yeah. No, it, you're literally helpless. And in our case, we're completely at the mercy of the skills of our pilot. And if it weren't for his skills, we would still be down there. I wouldn't be talking to you. And there was a moment when the thought crossed my mind when I resigned to the fact that oh, I was gonna lose my life down there. Um, uh, the thought crossed my mind, and it may seem a little morbid, but it's just what happened, that I was going to join the people who had lost their lives down there. I mean, I literally had that thought. Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join the people who lost their lives down here. I'm going to become like a ghost down here, part of the ghostly Titanic yeah. uh, grave site. So it, it's something that is now mindful of these poor five souls down there, whether they're alive or dead. Uh, I, I've, I've been living their hell all over again these last 72 hours or so and it's woke up this morning hoping for good news the noises but as you say um we don't know what are causing the noises if they're still alive they're banging on the inside of the sub it could just be a, a, a piece of metal that's come loose and it's just banging against uh, we just don't know and it's these are random noises uh there's apparently no uh, code people are saying sos well you know what if I were stuck in that sub down there, I wouldn't be doing an SOS. Just bang on the thing. Just make as much noise as you can because sound travels fantastically in water, much better than it does in the air. So that's why whale songs can travel halfway around the world. Hmm. Sound is a very good conductor of uh, uh, the ocean is a very good conductor of sound. So I would just be making as much noise. But I'd get my shoe, my cups. I'd be just banging away or take shifts. There are five people. Each person does it for, what, 12 minutes, take a rest but just keep the noise coming so i don't put a lot of importance in that noise uh, although i'm still hoping there's always hope i won't give up hope until the bitter end but right now it takes two and a half hours two to three hours to mm. get down there mm. so even if we triangulated their location we'd need three transponders at least or three uh, hydrophones three sonar devices listening devices to triangulate then you have to get a submersible that's capable of going to the bottom when I went down, only the French and the Russians had ships capable of going down to the bottom uh, to withstand the enormous pressure. So at this point, it um, I don't want to say it's hopeless. I never give up hope. They're going to continue the search. Whether we find the vessel or not, Mike, is another story. It took us 73 years. Think about it. The Titanic sank in 1912. It wasn't discovered, the wreck wasn't discovered until 1985 by, by my good friend Bob Ballard, a marine scientist at Woods Hole in Massachusetts. Yeah. 73 years to find a gigantic ship. What are the odds we're going to find something that is the size of a mosquito by comparison right. in this vast ocean? I don't know if we'll ever find the vessel. We may never know yeah. what went wrong. 